such wonderful people and, and such accomplished people. And I would start by welcoming Raja Dan. During the war, many Japanese Americans, one way or another, became a little bit disgusted with the United States. And some of them wanted very, very much to renounce their citizenship. They were not able to do so. The Justice Department, for some reason or other, decided to grant the request. And the Attorney General of the United States authorized his subordinates to draft such a statute. And Edward Ennis, who was the chief man and responsible for aliens and for Japanese Americans later, drafted such a statute and it explicitly would expire after the war. That, it seems to me, was the, the most shameful act uh, of the government because it happened at a time when it was quite clear that the war was all but over, although they, they, didn't, they didn't yet realize that it would be ended by an atomic bomb. The army could not enter Tule Lake camp or any other camp without the precise, explicit invitation from one person and one person only, the director of the camp. So Ray Best got the army to come in and much conflict continued. An FBI investigation which was kept secret and the FBI never publicized it, uh, made it clear that uh, there was violence, unnecessary violence, inappropriate violence and torture. A large space was set up for a detention area, and within that detention area, there was a jail constructed. Uh, this was unheard of. Uh, didn't happen anywhere else. None of these problems happened anywhere else. The government got many people in Tule Lake who were not obviously angry to leave Tule Lake for other places. And other camps were invited to send people who they regarded as bad actors, uh, undesirables to Tule Lake. So there was a, a vast exchange population, uh, which was very complicated. And the government's idea was that all the loyal people should be loyal in their terms, not my terms. All the loyal people should have to leave, but, the loyal, but some of them didn't want to leave, and they threatened to go on a strike. And I guess one more strike at Tule Lake was too much even for the officials there, so they finally said, okay, okay you can stay. But that certainly made the life at Tule Lake more complicated because some of the uh, well, the, the two groups did not get along. Let's, let's, just, let's just leave it at that. When I started, Judy and I started working on Tule Lake, nobody was talking about segregation. You know, there, the, the material would talk about uh, the horrible loyalty questionnaire and then would then pivot to telling about um, the courage and the bravery of the 442, totally ignoring what happened to the people who gave the so-called wrong answers to this loyalty questionnaire. So I'm just so grateful that Roger is a part of beginning to fill in this whole story of what happened to the people who had the courage to stand up and protest. They did peaceful protests, they spoke out. And for that, they were brutally punished, not only by the government, but by our own community. And I think that this is what Roger has referred to, is the, that that is the real tragedy, is the perpetuation of the racist propaganda that our community has internalized. 
Collins was the second man with a purpose to get into Tule Lake. This is uh, while the war still going on. His boss, Ernst Biesig, had gone into Tule Lake and not gotten anywhere. When he went to get in his car, he found out that, it, which was in a guarded parking lot, he found out that it had been uh, sabotaged, presumably by government employees uh, with sand, etc., so his car wouldn't start. So he sent Collins out, and he talked to people, and he did, didn't know what they were undergoing. Uh, and he sat there and scribbled out the form letter that they should write to request a formal hearing from the government. So all the process that led to this came initially from that, that first, really second, entrance of a civil rights lawyer uh, to the Tule Lake camp. Uh, and uh, he deserves uh, a monument somewhere. Let me say a little about Crystal City. It's run by the Justice Department. It was originally for, for aliens. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very, very different place. Right. Uh, if there were, most families were in independent units, or semi-dependent unions. And if there were minor children in the family, there would be a quart of milk a day for each one deposited at the doorstep. This, this was not a, nothing like a WRA camp. In eastern cities, the WRA had established offices which developed hospices for them to go to. I know a great deal about the, uh, the hospice in Cincinnati, for example. But there, there certainly was, even there, not the kind of adequate, adequate help that one would expect, but they did, they did set up, and, and these hospices generally were run by humanitarian organizations, the Quakers, uh, and certain other religious or religious-oriented uh, nonprofits. They were all eventually dispersed and fairly rapidly. Uh, it's not the easiest place to get in and out from, and I believe it took some days to do so. But, but, and this was true in many of the other cases, but th there was a dispersion, both in the, the West Coast and to the rest of the country. On a tourist visit to Angel Island, I went through and I discovered something that they had never discovered. Uh, messages from Nikkei, written as other messages are on the walls or in wood, uh, being sent to Japan at the end of the war uh, in, de in December of 1945, when it was uh, before Collins's edicts, so that there there were people who went back then, and there were it was and it was not possible immediately after the war for people left in the United States who wanted to go back to go back, and then and in many cases not go back because uh, uh, Nisei went who'd never been there, and who had no Japanese. But they were, by that time, they were on their own propulsion. They're not, they were not being sent, they were going. Coming back turned out to be more difficult, but, but it could be managed. One of the little things that I was able to do, that I was kind of proud of, was that I was, I was asked to, to advise the Department of Justice official who, after redress, was put in charge of the order of redress administration. And I st 
expressed to him very, very strongly, and he agreed. He was a liberal Republican. By the way, there were liberal Republicans then. Uh, he was a liberal Republican, an, appoint, an appointee of, of, of Senator Irvin Ives. Uh, and two members of his staff were attached to the Tokyo Embassy for more than a year, tracking down uh, people who had been in camp, because they too were eligible for the money. Uh, there was a, a suit attempted uh, uh, son of a the son of a German American Nazi who got deported to Germany uh, tried to by, tried to get that those payments stopped but of course he failed uh, just another sidelight, so that uh, so that redress money was delivered there, and, and even in that period, twenty thousand American dollars was, uh, I'm sure, a good a, a good bit of money to any of those families. When I spoke in at the University of Hawaii, one of, this is one of the most touching things that's ever happened to me about this, uh, where. Facts about the incarceration were very little known. Uh, I met with a number of people who made it clear to the university people that I wanted to meet with them, that they wanted to meet with me and I was happy to do so. And they all turned out to be renunciants. Or people who had otherwise lost their citizenship. And uh, I was happily able to tell them that many of them, not, not, not all the renunciants, but that many of the, uh, the other prisoners had been included in a Truman amnesty in 1947. But the government never bothered to try and get that information out to the general public. So they had, they, so they had, they had not known about it. And, uh, it was a very impressive moment, and to stand in front of uh, men roughly my own age, a little older, most of them, but not much, uh, and with, uh, with tears streaming down their face, uh, and tears of gratitude, uh, that, uh, because I had told them something that they were very, very glad to hear, that they were still citizens. But the government never bothered to do that. And there's a, uh, there are a lot of, uh, of this kind of absent-minded uh, disconcern for people who are somehow uh, a little below the table in the eyes of the government. Uh, uh, they, they don't watch out for their rights as they would for most of us. Of course, these days, uh, the government, some of the government doesn't look out for any of us, but that's something else again. I want to mention that Roger's 2017 book includes the Japanese American renunciant cases in the book, and he writes about the Abo family, which is the family that the cases of concerning the renunciants are, are named after. So, and it's really it's the first scholarly treatment of the Japanese American renunciants. That when two meet Nisei met each other after 1945, sooner or later the question came up, what camp were your folks in, were you and your folks in? It's quite clear that most Tuleans did not want to answer that question and uh, apparently tried to evade it with some success. Major Japanese American civil organization, I mean, let me name it here, encouraged a kind of separate status for people who had been at Tule Lake. Because that was a bad place where bad things happened. And it was obviously their fault. It's a, it's a standard. This is blaming the victim, which is what quite often happens.
I'm grateful for this moment to thank you, Dr. Rogers and Barbara, because it's through your writing and your investigation and you, your research that you uh, redeemed my parents' reputation and switched my understanding of who they were as human beings from uh, being cowards and disloyal uh, to being protesters and dissidents and people who defended their rights as U.S. citizens. So thank you. Thank you very much. No generation can look objectively at itself, just as no individual, however honest one wants to be, can really uh, be in a position to judge themselves. It's uncertain. You can certainly judge sometimes when you made a success, apparently, or committed a boner, apparently. History is a never-ending and never and always changing phenomena because it depends in part on what happened in the past and part what happens to the present, the questions that the present will ask about the past. And these will change as the present changes. And that present will also become the past eventually, or the next day, perhaps. It's the, the constant fascination of history. There are facts, but they are different depending on what has happened in between. That's kind of a paradox, but I think it's true. Not too, a few weeks ago, I was on a cruise to Alaska, and I took with me a talking book version of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's partial memoir, 20 hours worth and sat on a, the veranda. I thought I'd be sitting in sun, but it rained all the time. I mean, you're covered on the boat, but it's, it's not the same. But anyway, uh, I'm now, I, I may never mail it, but I'm now composing a lecture to her, a letter to her, asking her if there's not some way she can sneak in a word on this or that opinion or dissenting opinion uh, about the Japanese American cases, which, uh, not the last one, not Endo, but the others. The others. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't make any great bets on getting that done by that method or any other, but I wouldn't discourage anybody from trying to do it. <laughs> the fact that Japanese, the, that the relocation of Japanese Americans was so wrong is now really instituted in American society. 